according to the schedule, I have three hours of my lectures. Uh, basically, I will divide my lecture into two parts. The first part is a more a general picture about the demographic change in China and the, the interaction with the family planning policy and the internal migration and the related policies. And then we have a break. After that, I will talk about how the printing system in the rural China affect individual well beings, more specifically, how the rural printing system, especially in 2009, affect the health outcomes and the living arrangement, which are two important dimensions of individual well beings in China. So, uh, let, let me start with the first uh, topic and the question change labor market and the economy in, in China. Uh, so uh, basically, this the structure uh, of my lecture. I will briefly talk about uh, what, what the current demographics in China looks like. And then, uh, when, when the people talking about the population or demographic in China, one key issue, of course, is the family planning policy in China. And then I will talk about the policy. Um, and the implications of these policies, and how this policy will affect, uh, and also the demographics will affect the labor market in China. And uh, when we're talking about the labor market in China, one significant phenomenon is, of course, is the migrations, is the people moving from the rural area to the urban area, from the inland province and to the coast areas. Um, then we're talking about the reforms recently. One is the, we know, uh, since last year, we have the changed the family planning policy to a universal two-child policy. What's the perspective of these policies? And then, in order to you know, deal with the aging process, is further before needed how this new policy will look like. Um, and then we'll discuss under the current situation of demographics of China, how the um, society as a whole um, should uh, you know, uh, deal with that, what kind of policy option we have. Um, so th that's, that's the first part uh, 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 of my lectures. Um, during my talk, um, if, I have, if anybody have any questions, please feel free to, uh, to ask, okay? Um, so, um, What's, what's the demographic in China look like? Um, is anybody hear me clearly? Okay, I, I think so. Um, so when, when the people are talking about the demographic in China, uh, there are two key points at least. One is the population size. Of course, everybody knows that China has the largest population size uh, over the world. Okay, so it's over um, 1.3 billion already, and the second phenomenon currently attract a lot of attention is the aging process of China, uh, of population in China. Okay, uh, so from uh, this graph, it's, we can see very clearly since 1953 uh, to 2015, the people, the older people, that's defined as the population age over 65 increased quite a lot, uh, from around 4.4% to over 10%. Okay, so according to the definition of the aging society, if, if um, a, kind, a society uh, which old population over 7% is considered the aging society, so uh, China entered in an aging society a long time ago, okay, uh, and the process is, is still uh, undergoing. So th that's why there are a lot of people and have a lot of implications on different dimension of China societies. Okay, um, so uh, the, the bottom line is the percentage of the old, older people are just so, so it's increasing and uh, really fast. How fast, I will talk at this later, put into the international context. Um, another aspect of the population, of course, as economists will, 
who always care about the working populations, which define as the people aged from 15 to 64. Okay, for this segment of populations, okay, it, it's kind of keep increasing until 2000s. In the 2010, the percentage of this segment of population pick up, pick out, and start decrease. Okay, so a lot of people think the 2010 is a very important turning point, which the working population, the percentage of working population start decreasing. Okay, so the, the trend is very clear. Uh, along with the working populations and the aging process of the populations, the dependent ratio are also changing a lot, okay? Um, the dependent ratio, we, we can define different dependent ratios. One is the old dependent ratios. Uh, the, 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 that's the how many older people, you know, account for the whole society. Of course, along with the aging process, the more percentage of people becoming older, so this depend, dependent ratio are, are increase, okay? And the, the other dependent ratio is the children dependent ratios, okay? Because the development of a society and the decrease of the fertility rates, so each family have less children, so this dependent ratio actually decreased until re very recently. So overall, we see from the 1982 to 2014, the overall trend is kind of decreasing. Okay, decreasing. That's, that's in some ways, it's a good thing because there are more working people and uh, less people only consume but not working. But again, around 2010, uh, this trend, this decrease, decreasing trend, a kind of, you know, experience a turning point and the start to increase. So a lot of uh, economists, also uh, uh, sociologists, uh, also the people study population, taking this year as an alarming turning point. Okay, so uh, that's the general pictures. Yes? How, how is the dependence ratio calculated? The dependence ratio is calculated as the percentage of, of the um, certain age, certain cohort, for example, for the old, for the old dependent ratio, that's will be simply calculated as the older people divided by the working populations. Okay, so is the children's dependent ratios. Okay, so if the dependent ratio are higher, there's more you know, less people working and the bottom more people are consuming. Um, then that will put a lot of pressure on, especially the, for example, the pension systems. Okay. So given, given the retirement system in China, then uh, Japan is even higher. Yeah, that's right. That's even higher because now we will define the um, old population as the people age over 65. Okay. But nowadays the retirement age, the mandatory retirement age, depends on whether you are male or female, you are manual worker or blue color worker, etc. is it's from 50 to 60 years old. So the actual retirement age is quite younger than, than the definition we adopt here for the age populations. And I briefly mention that when during my talk. Okay, uh, so <coughs> the, the, the aging process in China we see it's kind of increasing, but uh, how fast this process in in the context of international uh, world, okay? If we put this in, into an international perspective, we can see that in, if we rank how old the, the country compared with other countries, in 1960s, the China is ranked as 75, okay? But in 2015, then the aging degree is ranked as 60, so, Overall, it means the speed of the aging process in China is faster than the average aging speed all over the world, okay? Uh, so, in the following, I give you some more concrete numbers. Now, at least three countries, China, uh, that's everybody knows, Italy and Japan. Italy and Japan are two of the most 
aged or aging countries over the world, one is in European countries and uh, one is the Asian countries. Okay, for the older populations, the percentage of the older population increased from 4% to 10%. How long take these countries from, for the, to, to achieve this, this, this you know, increase? For Italian, it takes more than 10, once 100 years, okay? It's from 1960, it's around 5%, and then 1860, and then until 1964, it's reached around 10%. So the, the aging process from 5% to 10% um, for Italian, it takes 100 years. For Japan, everybody know Japan, the aging problem in Japan is uh, quite serious, okay? In 1950s, um, the old population in China, in Japan is around 4%, um, and it takes 35 years for Japan to increase from 4% to, to 10%, so it takes 35 years. But for China, the speed are much faster than both the Italian and the Japan. It only takes 30 years from 1984 to 2015, okay? Of course, the, the speed of the aging process in China are combination of different factors. For example, the development of the society and uh, the, the labor participation of the female and the improvement of education level and also the contribution of the family planning policies. So, um, in 2010, the, the China already is an aging society, and the, in the literature, um, they also divided the, the society into different um, categories according to the degree of the agents. Uh, if a country or the population is reached 14%, it's called age society. It's a, uh, you know, above 21%, it's called hyper age society. So um, a lot of demographers do predictions and uh, it's predict uh, in 2027, the China will reach age society and in 2047, then the, the, the China will reach uh, hyper-aged societies. So this, this is the pictures. So what's the contribution? Why the, the aging speed in China uh, increase so rapidly? At least we can see from the pictures the two rates uh, contribute to the aging process. One is the bottom line is the death rate, okay? The death rate from 1950 to 2000 uh, decreased dramatically, especially um, for the years before 1980s, okay? The, the death rate uh, decreased quite a lot. The, the death rate, the decrease of death rate, that means that the people are living longer and longer, the more older, the more older people can survive that's one factor. And the other, of course, is the decrease of the fertility rate. So we have three fertility rate, the national rate, the, the fertility rate in the urban areas, and the fertility rate in, in the rural areas. Um, overall, we can see, if we take in the national fertility rate as, as examples, we can see that that's also, um, especially from around 1960s to 1980s, experienced dramatic decrease, okay? So both the mortality rate, the death rate, and the fertility rate decreasing uh, contribute uh, to the increasing of the aging societies because uh, I mentioned already, for the, for the decrease of, of the death rate uh, means uh, the people can live longer and for the decrease of the fertility rate, that means the younger people are, uh, you know, born less and less. Okay, um, so th th that's the general picture of the, um, of the quantity of the population. If we're looking into the 
uh, quality side of, of, of Chinese population, uh, the, the, the news is kind of good, uh, but uh, they also have a drawbacks. I will talk later. From 1964 to 2015, if we, you know, talking about the people, uh, divided people into the education categories, we can see, you know, especially for the people who have a, a college and above education, the percentage of them are increased quite a lot. So overall, the education level in Ch of the Chinese population increased significantly um, over this period. Um, okay, so th th that's uh, it's a really good thing because the human capital in China improved quite a lot. Um, Another things, okay, also related to the, to the aging society, also related to the death of the fertility rate. Uh, the, the death rate is the uh, life expectancy uh, in, in China at the birth. Uh, from 1960 to 2015, okay, the, 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 this life expectancy increased quite a lot, dramatically, okay. Um, in 1960s, Okay, uh, for the people born at that time, they can expect life expectancy is around uh, 43 years old, something like that. But uh, in the more recently, uh, the people can live around more than 70 years old. Okay, ah, okay. So this is have a really important implications if we think about the retirement age. Just uh, um, Professor Wang mentioned in China, the retirement age is, you know, since the funding of New China is never changed very significantly. The, the retirement age in China, I just mentioned, depends on the male or female, what kind of occupation are you in. It's uh, around 50 to 60 years old. Okay. So that means if the retirement age is stayed constant, but, but you can live longer, so what's the consequence? of this phenomenon, this will, you know, put more burdens to the pension systems, especially because there are less people, there are more people rely on the pension, they can live longer, and the, the, the more people, you know, be, become old, old. That's, that's the aging process of, of the population, that's one dimension. And the, the other dimensions, the duration of the people who rely on the, um, pension system also become longer because they can live longer. Okay, so they just put a lot of pressures on the, on the pension systems and the other welfare systems. So that, that's the general picture of Chinese um, population currently uh, or from the his, history, historical perspective. Okay, um, so I just mentioned um, one of the most important, most important policy which related to, to the, uh, this uh, demographic change is the family planning policies. So why I call it policies? Because this the family planning policies uh, is, is changing constantly and uh, it's not only a universal unique policy but uh, it's a really complicated one set of policies. Okay, so this picture we already saw it before. Okay, um, so uh, before we talk about policy, we can see uh, that the uh, population size in China and also the um, population growth rate in China uh, from the 1950 to 2010. Um, okay, it's not surprising. Um, the population uh, size of China increased uh, since the beginning of the new funding of China until now, okay. Um, for, for the growth rate, okay, we can see after, civil, after the end of the Civil War, like every other countries, we have a baby boom, okay? So the, the population are increasing um, significantly. And then for, for the drop deep of the um, growth rate, this period reflects what? It, it's the famine period, great famine period, okay? So um, for whatever reasons, for that period, a lot of people death, okay? So the, the, the growth rate uh, decreased. And then, um, the China from the 1960s uh, started uh, talking about the family planning policies, okay, the different uh, kind of policies. Um, uh, we'll talk later. Uh, okay, the, the first one is will be the later, longer 
and the fewer. The later means the government encourage people to marry at the later age. And the, the, the longer means the birth space uh, become longer, okay? Uh, between the, the two births uh, uh, become longer. And the fewer, uh, that means for the parents, the, the government encourage parents have fewer children, okay? This, that's the initial family planning policies. And uh, this policy coupled with the development of Chinese economy have a really significant um, impact on the fertility rate. So it's decreased uh, quite dramatically from that period. Uh, you, as we see from the picture um, for the 1970s, okay. Um, so <coughs> basically, um, in, in the 1962, uh, the, the Chinese central government officially issued uh, administrative documents which regarding the family planning policies, that's can many people think that, that this document is kind of marked the beginning of China's family planning policies. Um, okay, at that period, um, this policy uh, really have uh, two component. One is provide the family planning knowledge and the technologies to, to the household who, who need um, uh, them. And the other is uh, put the best quarters to different groups, okay. Um, so for the, for the best quarters, they are not universal, everybody knows. Uh, some people may feel from the area, some people may, may from the urban area, some people may be the Hanzhou, some people may be not, are minorities. Okay, depends on your um, ethnicities or the, which area you are, or the who you are from. The birth quarter are different from, for example, um, for the Han, urban Hanzhou, okay, from 1963 to 1970, the birth quarter is three, okay, and from 1971 to 1977, the quarter decreased to two, and after that, okay, we have the one child policy. Of course, the one child policy is not also is not universal. For all the household can only have a one child, but uh, they also have a lot of uh, different. Um, so, initial, uh, so after the um, 1980s, the Chan, China's family planning policy you already know as the one child policy, but it's not accurate reflection the nature of the family planning policies because uh, the, I mentioned not, not every household can only have one child. Actually, the, the, this policy vary considerably uh, by the, whether you are from the urban or from the soil or whether, which ethnicity group you are, um, belong to. And uh, also the, the policy also will change over time. Okay. Um, uh, so how they change over time and uh, uh, close time, close regions, close the zoo and urban ethnicities, um, we, we just list some number here, but uh, I just uh, keep, uh, skip them and uh, instead of, uh, you know, um, flood with your order numbers. Um, so um, how, what's the impl implications of the family planning policies? Uh, okay. Uh, the, at the beginning, I said uh, the, 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 this policy um, is one of the most important social, po social policy in China. And it, it started in the 1960s. And uh, um, until now, we're still under uh, this set of policies. So it has implications on different dimensions of Chinese societies. Okay. Um, so I will highlight uh, some dimensions of the implications, the fertility, the sex ratios, age and gender compositions, and the labor supply, and also the human capital. Okay. The fertility rate, I will already mentioned, this the overall general picture of the fertility. Um, and, and, um, but uh, how the family planning policy affect fertility rate in the literature actually um, it's kind of mixed. Uh, it's not really reached a consensus. Um, most people agree that the family planning policies have a significant uh, effect or impact on the fertilities. 
but most study also found that this policy can only explain a small amount of the decline of the fertility rate, okay? So we also see uh, the decreasing of the fertility rate are quite dramatic. If the family planning policy can only explain a small amount, so why is it decrease quite a lot for, for, for the China's fertility rate? The, a lot of people will contribute the decline of the fertility rate not only into the family planning policies, but uh, for other broader factors. Um, one important one is the social economic development. For example, the females' education that, that will increase, that, that will decrease fertility rate. The female education, of course, uh, at least they, they have uh, uh, two dimensions which affect the fertility rate. One is if the female get more education, then the marriage age will postpone mechanically. That's one thing. And the others, the shadow price of have a baby will increase. Okay, so that will decrease the, the, the fertility rate. Um, um, and the other, of, of, of course, is the, the whole structure of economy changed. is shifting from the agriculture activity to the more, you know, industrial-based um, productions. Um, so um, if we're looking all over the world, for other countries um, didn't have a family planning policy, along with economic development, the fertility rates are also experienced the drastic decrease. Okay, so when, when talking about the decrease of fertility rate in, in China, um, most people think of the, the factors is the family planning policy. But, but if we look more broadly, Probably that's not true. The other more broader factors are also important to explain this, this, this phenomenon. Okay. Um, the, 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 there are also some studies uh, found um, which give exact numbers. And one of the study is using the um, experiment in China. I will talk later. Uh, it's by my, by my colleague. Uh, that the one child policy the effect on the fertility rate is quite limited. Okay. Um, but, but nonetheless, um, this policy changed the balance of sex ratio just dramatically. Okay. Um, in the society or in, in the human society, uh, the male and the female. The normal sex ratio is around 103 to 107. That's, that's the normal ratios. Um, in China, this ratio from 1982 uh, to 2010 changed quite a lot. In 1982, it's uh, you know, still normal. It's around 108, but uh, in 2010, this ratio increased to 117, okay? Um, so, if we look more details uh, about the ratio by the whole, the, the, the Chinese as, as a whole, or by, by the Han, Zhu, or by the minorities, then we can see um, most of the increase is coming from the Han, Zhu, okay? And the, for, for the imbalance of sex ratio for, for the other minorities is not as serious as the Hanzu because, of course, one reason is other minorities are not really subject to the restrictions of the family planning policies. So why the sex ratios are so significant impact, affect uh, by the family planning policies um, so there the, are the a combination of different force. Um, one is the social culture, is the some preference, especially in the zoo areas, because in the zoo areas, the, the family think 
the blood line are running from the father's side. Okay, so the, the, the sign is important uh, for, for uh, inheriting uh, the, 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 the household, the, the family. Um, and the other is the gender selection technology. Um, and uh, of course, the third one is the quarters imposed uh, by the family planning policies. All the factors that uh, contribute to this kind of increased imbalance of the sex ratios. Okay, so what's the what's the implications of, of uh, the, the, this kind of increased sex ratios to the labor market? One implication is probably will lower the female labor force participations according to the classical um, economic theory. Why is that? Because now we, we have a fewer female. If we have fewer female, then the shadow price of, of a female at home will increase. And the, then that will decrease the likelihood of the female to participate into the market labor market. Okay. Um, this policy also affect uh, the, the age and the gender compositions. The, the gender, we're talking about sex ratio, and now we're talking about the whole pictures uh, of the um, populations which uh, impact uh, under, the, under the policy. We already mentioned the key points already. Uh, the overall working population um, aged from 15 to 64 years old in 2010 is around 75%. That's the highest one. Okay, so it, it's compared with other developed countries, um, it's, and also developing countries, this percentage are still quite high. But uh, the, that's good news. The bad news, we already mentioned, is peak out. So the, the, the percentage is start decreasing. Okay. Um, the, the, the decline of the labor force, of course, will cause the labor shortage and also will push up the labor cost, especially the wage. Okay. Um, so uh, we do some simulations uh, by the uh, different uh, years of a census uh, from the 1990, 2000, 2010. Okay. Um, the simulation will have uh, two component. Um, this, this is the population pyramids, okay. Um, so the horizontal bar will represent uh, the, the percentage of the population at each group, okay. And then um, we divided the, the population into the left side and the right side by, by gender, okay. One side is male and the other side is the female, okay. Um, for a normal society, okay, um, the population pyramids will, will have a, like a, a pyramids, okay, that, that's like a pyramid exactly, have a broader base and uh, become narrow along, uh, go to the top, okay. So if the bottom become narrow, then we have a problem because we have a few younger people and eventually it's hard to replace the, 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 the populations, okay. So in, in the pictures and also for the following pictures, we have uh, two scenarios. One is the pyramids with the solid lines. That's the population pyramids calculated from the census. That's the actual pyramids in China. And then we have the pyramids without the borders, okay? That's the counterfactual kind of, kind of one. If we don't have the final planning policy, what's the population pyramids will look, would look like, okay? So that's the counterfactual kind of one. Um, so we can see um, the, no matter what, uh, the, the family planning policies uh, is an uh, important contributors uh, to change the structure of the pyramids in China, even as early as 1980s. And uh, from to, to 2000s, we see the actual one and the counterfactual one, the difference uh, become uh, even um, 
larger and uh, the, the, the age improved one in the 2010 has become even um, significant. And uh, if we, the, the China maintained the fertility rates as before, then probably we don't have the aging issue we are faced now. Okay, so the, 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 that's the uh, funding. The, the, that's that's the population. That's, that's the when we compare uh, two population pyramids under different scenarios. One is the actual one. The other is the simulated counterfactual one without family family planning policy. That will give us a direct, um, you know, impression how the, the, the family planning policy will you know affect the population pyramids and uh, will affect the, the, the aging process of China. How do you construct this uh, uh, yeah, uh, the, the, we construct construct one that's we just uh, you know we basically we maintain the the, the, the not growth rate, the fertility rates but different age group and then we do the in, in, you know irritation, yeah, to, to calculate this one and uh, based on the um, initial population structure of the populations. <coughs> so, um, because um, I'm, I'm myself as a labor economist, so one thing I want uh, to mention briefly is how the, the fertility um, rate, uh, the changing of fertility rate will, apply, will affect the, the sub labor supplies. Um, okay, um, in, the, in, in the economic models, um, really um, there were the, the, the fertility or the birth of the children and the labor supply of the female is kind of negatively correlated uh, because you, ha you have uh, um, a children, um, then it will become costly for you to uh, go into labor market. So that's, that's the standard trade-off models. Um, okay, um, but, uh, um, so uh, an important question is in China, okay, we see the decreasing trend of the fertility rate in China and the family size are getting smaller and the female uh, have a fewer children over time, is this uh, trend can increase the, the labor supply of the female, okay? Uh, that's empirical questions, okay? Theory is huge, but empirically, uh, many study found uh, actually uh, the effect from the decreasing of the, cho uh, of the, of the birth burning in China not really increase the female labor supply significantly, okay? Um, for example, uh, the people using the twins and uh, also um, there are two paper using twins and uh, both of them show that uh, one is found that the, indeed there's a kind of negative relations but the effect is more um, and the other is, is found it's, it's basically doesn't exist at all. Um, how about the human capitals? Okay, uh, for the human capitals, of, of course, the, the classical model is the Baker and the Lewis uh, QQ model, uh, quality and the quantity trade-off model. That's the rational is basically um, giving giving the fixed budget constraint of the household. Um, then, if you have more children, um, the household can invest in in the for the per children is becoming smaller and also time allocation of the parents to each children are become smaller, then the human capital accumulation will become smaller. Okay, uh, is this true in, in China? Okay, or put it more directly, is the family planning policy increase the quality of the children? Okay, uh, I think Almost all of them are Chinese uh, students. Um, I don't know whether you remember one slogan of the family planning policies um, when the central government 
propaganda, this policy is to control the size of population and increase the quality of the populations. Okay, so is this policy can really increase the quality of the populations, okay, at the national level or at the uh, household levels? Of course, if we look at the picture I already gave to you, the human capital accumulation in China increased quite a lot, uh, dramatically, uh, over uh, past decades, okay. Uh, with average years of schooling increase roughly uh, from 50%, if we're looking to the people age over 25, um, but the, the increase of the education level in the China's population is not really come from the family planning policies. Or at least, most of them are not from the family planning policies and from other factors. For example, the, the two representative papers who study this exact issues and the fund, okay, uh, the contribution of the one-child policy in China to develop to its human capital was modest, okay. It, it's, it's having positive contributions, but it's not really as significant as the central government uh, announced or supposed to be. Okay, so that's, 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 the, that's the theme. Okay, so uh, now we turn to the labor market. Uh, how the key features of the demo demographic uh, in China have an impact on labor market? What's the relations for this two? Okay, um, so uh, I, I will you know highlight some key facts again and then. Uh, talking about implications of these key factors uh, to, to the implications of the labor market. Okay, we already said, uh, okay, the working age populations um, is still high in China, but is decreasing, okay. Uh, then, <coughs> one, uh, the, the one implications of the decreasing of, of the working age populations um, is the people worry about uh, that the China will run out of the first demographic dividend. So what's the first demographic dividend I will define later. Um, the decline of the labor force will also cause the labor shortage and uh, increase the, the, uh, the wage, okay. From, th th this is the data from the um, statistical yearbook from 1984 to 2010, um, we deflated the, the wage index uh, to uh, 2080 as the base year. We can see um, the, the wage rate in China increased dramatically, okay? Depends on which sector you're working on. Um, it's increased nine times or eight times. Uh, it's, it's quite a lot, okay? So the, the, the increase of the labor cost have uh, profound implications um, to, to China. One is it will, you know, affect the, the industrial structures. We already see this, along with the increase of the wage cost, the labor cost, uh, the, uh, some industrials already, who, you know, is a labor intensive industrial already move from the coast area, like, like Guangdong, to the inland province already, like, like, like Guangdong, Shenzhen, et cetera. Uh, the, the, it's not, no longer profit for the employers or to, to investors to uh, open business, the labor intense business at the coast areas. So a lot of them moved to the, to the in, inland province. Um, and uh, also uh, some industrial already moved to other, um, countries with uh, less labor cost, uh, like Vietnam, Bangladesh, et cetera, okay, so th this uh, will change the, the, the industrial structures, okay. Um, so uh, the other, the second thing is, of course, um, the increase of labor cost will also, you know, require the country to upgrade I its industrial um, structures, not, you know, um, really maintain the, the, the old structures, so 
the technology, the capital intensive one, uh, become uh, necessary. Okay. Um, the, the other key factors is a kind of imbalance of the male uh, female sex ratios. Okay. The, the, this, this kind of the, this inverse ratio also have uh, implications uh, for the labor market. One I already mentioned before is, is a few female in, in, in the populations. Okay, so the share price of the female will become will become higher at, at the household for the household productions that will lower the female labor participation rates. Okay, that's again will negatively affect labor force. Okay, we remember the overall labor force is decreasing and now the less female participate in the labor market. So the active labor force will further decrease. That's created the labor shortage and also increase the labor cost. Okay. Uh, another thing is probably will increase the, the saving rates. Well why it will increase the saving rates? There is a famous paper uh, by two Chinese uh, economists, Wei Sanji and San Xiaobo, who think that the, because the imbalance of sex ratios, so uh, the, the, the male must compete for wife at the marriage market. One competition um, math is to have more savings. Okay, so that's what increasing increase the, the, the saving rate. Okay, if the saving rate are increased, then the physical capital will accumulate it, okay? If the society have a more human capital, probably it will have a higher productivity. And also, if you save more at your adult age, and then it's possible you can start new business uh, at, at, at a later stage, uh, for example, now a lot of the aging countries talking about shared economies, uh, there are two aspects. One is the industrial structures will focus on the demand of the older people, and the other is older people start all entrepreneurs uh, and enterprises, okay, the, 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 the uh, entrepreneurship of the old populations, okay. So the increase of the saving rates will make this kind of change are possible. So the, this, the male buyer, buyer sex ratio will have implications for the labor market. One is kind of the negative, it's a decrease the, the female labor participation rates. And the, the other is kind of positive one because uh, the, the competition for the marriage market push the household to save more. And this in turn will, you know, uh, increase the, the, the productivity uh, of the society and uh, uh, can have a, a you know, basis to start a survey economy. <coughs> um, another key factors in, in the beginning I mentioned in, in, over the past decades, the education level improved in considerably in China, of course. Improved human capital is really good because we already said that the labor intensive industry in China is become less and less attractive. So as a country as a whole, the upgrading the industrial is become necessary and the human capital provide, improvement of the human capital provide the basis for this kind of upgrading. But on the other hand, they also have a negative impact. Why is that? Because when you get more education, that means you spend more time at school. Okay, the, the GF schooling are increasing, and then the actual working time for each person will decrease, right? Uh, for, for, for one of you, your, your PhD students, probably you enter into the labor market at the age of 27 or 30 years old, not, not like the, in, in the older days, the people ate, enter into the labor market at age 18. So, so that's a 10 years difference at least, right? So um, the duration in the labor market are shortened, okay? 
Of course, uh, one thing I did mention is that for a lot of the male and the female students here, uh, the, the schooling are also related to, to, to the marriage. Yes, okay. Usually speaking, if you are stay longer in the school, you are get married at a later stage. That will decrease the fertility rate even further. What you, so the, the improve of education level, there are good perspective. Uh, I mean, uh, one one the, 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 the good one is that uh, is provide the, the, the basis for, for the industrial upgrading, but also it have a negative effect, a possible potential negative effect. Okay. Um, and another key factors I mentioned is the life expectancy has increased. It's around from 1960 is about 45 years old to nowadays is over 75 years old. Of course, the increasing of life expectancy is a really good thing. That's the witness of the achievement of Chinese uh, development, the, uh, development, development of societies. Um, but, but on the other hand, if now retirement system are not, you know, changing accordingly, then that's a great pro problems because the people will have a longer period we long, rely on pension system and old age support. Okay, now, so the increase of the life expectancies that required the government or the public public policy change accordingly that the society can really tap on the human resources of the older populations. For example, we can adopt more flexible retirement age and increase the, 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 the labor participation rates of the older people that, that will you know, prolong the first dividends, um, population dividends. Um, okay, <coughs> so um, th that's, that's the, we're talking about some key factors and the implications to, uh, key factors of the population in China and the implication to Chinese labor market. And another important phenomenon in China's population as well as labor market is the internal migrations, okay. But every China knows since the big, before and opening up of Chinese societies, uh, the internal migration is a, big, is a really significant social and uh, economic phenomenon. Okay, um, so um, the age structure of a region or of a province is really shaped not only by the fertility and the mortality, but also by the migrations. Okay, in China, the migration we're talking about, or well, the most important one is from rural to urban migration. And uh, this migration, the, the direction is, all, is really from the inland to the coastal areas, okay. The migration in China, at least most of them, is a labor market phenomenon. A lot of people, migrants, are for jobs, okay. Th that's the key features of Chinese internal migrations. That's kind of different from uh, some other countries. <coughs> um, so, um, how the migration, internal migration, affect the aging or the age structure of different part of China, okay? so. In this slide, we have uh, four um, figures. This uh, is uh, from four census. Um, it's the 1982, um, 1990, 2000, 2010, okay. For the area, if it's darker, that means it's, uh, the, the aging degree is more serious, okay. So overall, we can see that along with times, not surprising, the aging problem in China is, is become serious. That's already known. But another thing is 
the, the aging process or the degree of the aging in China is not universally the same. They have uh, regional differences. S some regions are really quite old. For example, like Sichuan, right? Um, uh, Liaoning, etc., or some, some Jiangsu, Shandong, uh, no, this is not Shandong, uh, this is Jiang, uh, Jiangsu, okay. For, for some regions, um, uh, the, <coughs> the population are quite old, um, but for some other provinces, uh, the, the degree of, of the aging is relatively okay, okay. So the, 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 that's one, uh, one picture I want to show you. Um, for, for, for when we calculate the, the, the aging, uh, the, the how old each province, we use the resident populations, okay? Not only in the population with the local hukou, but also including the migrants from other provinces as well, okay? Because lots of the yeah. younger workers. Exactly, exactly. That's because the, the migrants. Okay. So if we do a simple plot, we can see uh, the aging rates of the local population. As local population, I mean the, the, the Hukou populations, it's kind of positively related with the immigration rates, okay? That means if a province become, the population become quite old, then it will demand for the migrants from other provinces. So if one region has a high degree of the aging, then it attract migrants. So the relationship is kind of positive, okay? <coughs> and uh, then, Another side of the story is that if, uh, uh, another, uh, if this region attract a lot of migrants, then it will ease the degree of the aging. That's not surprising, right? So um, th th these two um, figures just tell you the, 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 the same story. Um, so um, then if we're looking the, the change of the aging process from the 1990 to 2000, to, from the 2000 to 2010, by, by province, we can see, um, <coughs> indeed, for some province, okay, like Guangdong, etc., Remember, okay, when Chinese studied the family planning policies, okay, really the urban areas, the coast areas are enforced more strictly, and the, the inland areas are less strictly. So if there's no migrations, then the inland area should be become more older uh, than the coast areas. But because internal migrations, this changed the, the structure of the aging process of the coast areas and the inland areas. Okay. Overall, the, the message is quite simple. The inter internal migrations shift partly the aging problem from the inland provinces no, shift the aging problem partly from the coast areas, from the inland areas, from the in inland areas. Because we already mentioned the internal migration in China, the key feature of the internal migration in China is labor market phenomena. okay? So the migrants are mostly, almost of them are working age populations. Okay, the prime age populations. So in the process of internal migrations, the internal, the internal province lost um, prime age populations uh, to the coast areas. That will shift uh, the 
aging problem from the coast areas to the inland areas. Uh, if we're looking at the zoo and urban, that's also true, okay? Um, in the family planning policy, we also we already know, or everybody knows, um, in the urban areas, the fam family planning policy are strictly enforced. We have one child policy, but the, in, in the zoo area, really, if the, the household have a first one as a daughter, they are really allowed to have a, a second child. So really, they called a one and a half family planning policy in the, in the zoo area, but in China, it's really the one child policies. Okay, if there's no migrations, then the aging should be ser more serious in the urban areas than in the zoo areas. But again, because the migration from the zoo to the urbans, then we can see that the aging problem are more serious in the zoo areas than in the urban areas. Okay, so this kind of process actually posed great challenge for the social security and old age support. There are several reasons for that. <coughs> because we already mentioned for the inland province and the zoo areas, the f because of the internal migration, they lost prime age populations to the urbans, to the coastal areas. Okay. And also in China, we know the development development level of the urban and the zoo area are quite different. Really, the coast areas and the urban areas are more developed, developed than the zoo and the inland areas. And also for them, they have a better social security systems. Okay. Nowadays, because it's internal migrations, the aging problem saved to the relatively poor zoo areas and the inland areas, that's create great challenge um, for, for the social securities and for the old age support. Um, and another thing is the institutional arrangement of the social security system in China because uh, most countries, especially, um, for example, the European countries, the, the social security system is kind of pulling at the national levels. But in China, it's not, okay? In China, this kind of system, for example, the pension system is pulling at the provincial or even lower levels, okay? Um, that means um, one province surplus cannot use for other, other province surplus, okay? At the beginning of this year, I, I have a, um, a joint, uh, a, a, study group to investigate the uh, social pension systems in China and visit some, pro, some places, including the uh, Guangdong, um, like, like Guangzhou and Shenzhen, okay? So, for example, taking the medical insurance examples, the most generous program for the whole country is the Shenzhen, Shenzhen. okay? Um, probably because, I don't know whether you, you, you're familiar with the medical insurance um, system or not, okay? Um, really, for most province, the medical expenditure have a tax, have a ceilings, for example, for the Beijing citizens, okay? The tax is around uh, 300,000 yen per year, okay? Over that, you cannot get reimbursement from the uh, government, from the, from the medical insurance systems. But for the Shenzhen, it's basically no ceiling. There's no ceiling, okay? Why, why is no ceilings? Okay, because they have so much surplus, they cannot, you know, the, 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 the medical fund have uh, so much surplus. And uh, why, why is they have uh, so much surplus? Because Shenzhen is a migrant city that attract a lot of young migrants. And for the young people, usually they're really healthy. They don't, you know, become ill often. So they save quite a lot of, of, to, to, to contribute a lot to, to, the, to the medical fund. And now um, the, the, the medical fund are kind of pulling 
not even at the province level, at the prefecture or county level. Okay, so it, it, this internal migration and the different structure, a close public structure across the, the whole China really create big problem for the sustainability of the uh, social security system in China, including the pension, the medical insurance. It, that's two most important ones. Okay. <coughs> Of course, that's the private behavior, right? Yeah. But for the public policy one, it's not that. Because, um, for example, I went to the um, Jilin province, okay, so a lot of uh, government officials complain about the uh, unfair of the public policy and the, the social security systems. Why is that? Because um, Jilin province lost populations, especially the prime age populations to the coast areas. And uh, then in order to maintain the expenditure to, to meet the expenditure of, of, of the pension and the medical medical expenditures they need to increase the contribution rate okay if you increase the contribution rate uh, of the pension and the medical then who will pay for that the, uh, at least from two parts one is, is the individual contributions the other is the employer's contributions okay so if the employer needs to contribute more at the genium, but uh, contribute less at the coastal areas, nobody will open business at the genium province, at least in theory. Okay, the likelihood for, for the entrepreneurship activity um, in this kind of the province who lost population will, you know, kind of hamped by this regional difference of the, of the contribution rates. Okay. Um, so, um, <coughs> but, but, but uh, I mean, um, yes. So the the uh, the the function of it is different in different provinces and different countries. Isn't it a standard uh, a standard variation uh, all over the world, uh, all over the all over the country? Well, uh, the the Xin central government have a guidelines. To, to say what kind of percentage from what kind of percentage to what kind of, they have a range that the, the um, individual and the employer should contribute. Um, then the each province and also uh, is um, depends on what kind of the uh, insurance um, uh, have a, uh, the power, the right to decide the contribution rates. So. Um, for example, the, the contribution rates for the uh, pension are quite different across the whole China. Um, the the, the genius and the, is, is um, really extreme uh, the, the uh, northwest provinces. Um, there are several factors for that. One is I mentioned is the last prime age populations to the coastal areas. The other is activities is kind of slow down at, at the Jilin province. And then, you know, the contribution from the employers and from the employees, uh, you know, also lag behind the expenditures. That's really create pressure to, to the government to increase rate. Otherwise, they cannot really pay off uh, the, 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 the pensions. The pension will run into the bankruptcies, okay. But in the coast areas, like the Guangdong and the Zhejiang, there's no problem, although they have a surplus. So overall, the, the pension system, um, if we look in the national as a whole, it's kind of, we still have surplus, okay? But we look in the individual province, um, some province are really rich, okay? The, the surplus, uh, there are billions, um, thousands of billions of surplus. Uh, but uh, some province already have a deficit. They cannot really meet expenditures already.
Yes. Uh, so now it seems that uh, this problem is, will go even worse because now uh, the country is trying to relax the restriction in the migration between uh, regions like uh, some re reformation in the rural system. So do you think, well, what should we do in this part? Because it seems that there will be more young people going to uh, cities and uh, coastal areas. Well, of course, I mean, the, the the one of the institutional factors can contribute to this kind of imbalance is the pooling levels. Okay, we, we, we now we're pooling the pension system at the most at the province levels. That's not right. Okay, because the social security system should be pooling at the national levels. If we, you know, increase the pooling levels, it's not a problem. That means if Shenzhen has surplus, then it can, can be used to compensate the loss to, to Jilin province. Okay, so, so you mean we need some, some kind of like uh, institution that can uh, transfer, transfer between the areas? It's not really transfer because when, when the central government started to design the system of the social security, the pooling level, it should be at the national level, but in practice, due to different reasons, it's only pooling at the local level. Some even lower, for example, the medical fund are even pool, pooling at the you know, county level or the municipal levels. Okay. Um, for anybody from Guangdong or not, okay. Even for Guangdong, the pension system are not pulling at the province levels, okay? They try to do so, okay? So I think the, 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 the issue, um, if we only change one policy but another, that will, of course, create problems. Uh, so the public policy should be coordinated, coordinated with each other. Um, the migration policy, the local system, if we relax the mobility of the um, labels, the, the, the factors, then we should you know, create a universal, the, the fair mar market universally, for, at least for, for China, yeah. within China. So um, now, <coughs> that's the history, right? Um, another history, uh, become uh, not really become a history, but a, a uh, current policy for the family planning policy is the two-child policy, okay? The two-child policy is started uh, last year, okay? It's, it, it's um, um, so <coughs> one reason to adopt uh, the, the, the two-child policy to relax the, the Old ones, uh, because we, we're talking about is the aging problem faced by, by, by China. Um, so an uh, uh, important question is the, is the two-child policy can really, you know, deal with the solved aging problem uh, of uh, now countries' uh, aging problems? What's the implications for the future labor force? Okay, <coughs> even before the announcement of the two child policies. Uh, in the academic world, there are many studies on the implications of the two child policies, um, but uh, it's, not, it's really hard to reach consensus. Um, there are two um, representative studies, one is by Wang and the other is by Tsai, okay. Uh, for, the, for the research by Wang, um, you think um, if we have a two-child policy, um, the fertility rate will increase, but uh, it's only increased modestly. Okay, so he's really asked the government to adopt two-child policy as quickly as possible. Um, but for another group of people, they were really against that because the fear that the um, relaxed one-child policy will increase the fertility rate drastically and create more problem because the, a lot of people think that the 
publishing size is, is, is the root of the problem, but I'm not one of them. Uh, I don't think that's the root of the problem. Um, so uh, for, for, the, for this study, one is predict and the pred and the two chart policy, the fertility rate will increase a lot, and, and the other predict will increase, but only modestly. Okay, um, so what happened? What, what, what's really happened last year? Which one's right? And uh, from the data we know, the first one's right. Okay, after we adopt the two chart policy uh, last year, the additional burst is only three million, is only three million. Far less from the 20 million predict by Zai, okay? So the, the, the increase of, of fertility rate is only modest, it's only modest. Okay, I mentioned, okay, <coughs> at, at the beginning, um, one of my colleagues also have a study to see whether um, the impact of the one child policy and the two child policy on the fertility rates, okay. Um, basically, he used a synthetic control approach, okay. A synthetic control approach is a kind of like, like the matching um, methodology. Um, I was not talking now about uh, probably the Chris Tabler where we're talking about the synthetic control, okay. Um, the basic um, rationale is that um, in China, not all regions have one child policies. In some regions, they had, had changed one child policy to two child policy already long time ago. One of the city is called Yicheng. Why is Yicheng? Uh, Yicheng, yeah, Yicheng, okay. In the 1980s, okay, the Yicheng, uh, they used to be have a one child policy and then they relaxed the one child policy to two child policy, okay. So, but the surrounding cities, um, surrounding prefectures um, still have the one child policies, okay. So, using the Yicheng as a treated group and the surrounding one uh, as a control group and apply synthetic controllers, um, uh, these two um, economists study um, how this change of the Yicheng's family planning policy to the one child, to child, to two child will affect the fertility rate, okay? Um, so the basic <coughs> results are quite straightforward and surprising. It's have a almost zero effect in the short run. And uh, even when looking the long run, the effect for the two child policy is still quite limited. Okay, it's quite limited. Okay, so this also consistent with now is data from last year. I already mentioned last year we have the two child policy already, the universal two child policy. Uh, some people uh, said, well, said oh, they have a, one year they have a 20 million more births, but the end is not 20 million more births, it's only 3 million. Okay, so it's really. Uh, the effect is quite small, it's quite small. So we do some simulations on the different scenarios uh, of the uh, two child policy uh, to forecast uh, the, the population size, okay. The solid lie is still the maintain um, the one child policy and uh, then we adopt different parameters for the birth rates and the new two child policies, okay. We okay, have three parameters, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, means what? Means what if we have a two child policy, then each household we have additional 0 0.3 children, additional 0.5 children, additional 0.7 children, okay. Basically, the point seven children is unlikely, unlikely. This is quite high, okay. Most study in the literature agree it's around point three, okay. So we, we think that 
we adopt three parameters to see what will happen if under the different parameters, uh, the structure of the populations. Of course, um, uh, if you still under one child policy, then the population size will become still increase uh, for certain years, but uh, start decrease, okay? If uh, we think that we adopt a compromise parameters, if under two child policy, each household will additional 0.5 children, that's the dash line. In this line, we can see, well, in some degree, is, is the, the population will, will increase in um, the, the period uh, of the increased operation uh, become longer, but sooner or later it start to decrease, okay? Um, then if we look in the dependent ratio, if we, uh, if we uh, not dependent ratio, if we look into the old age population ratios, um, um, this is also the, the old population ratios and the one child policy and the two child policy, three different scenarios. Um, it's really clear that even if we adopt the most unlikely scenarios, the 0 0.7 parameters, um, the older people, the percentage of older people will keep increase constantly. So in some sense, th this picture just tells us that the Chinese society is from the aging society to the age society to the hyper age society is kind of inevitable, even if we have the two child policies. The thing is just the matter of time, okay? But the direction is kind of inevitable. Uh, so that's for the China. If we're looking around the world, see what, what, what's, what the country did. Okay, this, this is for the United Nations. Uh, the, the policy, the family, family planning policies, okay. Uh, yes, I almost done. Um, so we're putting this, uh, we'll have uh, some break and we'll come back. Um, <coughs> so y y y y if we're looking over the world to see the, the family planning policies for each country, there are at least three categories. One category is to encourage the birth rate, okay? The other category is to maintain, is, uh, you know, neither increase nor decrease. And the other is to control the birth rate, is to, is, uh, to control the birth rate, okay? So over, the period from 1976 to 2013, more and more countries are trying to increase the birth rates, okay? In the 1979, only nine countries adopt policy to increase birth rates. But to 2013, the number of countries try to increase birth rates increased to um, 27. Okay, um, and uh, since 1996, in the past 10 years, let's roughly speaking, um, around 40 countries are maintained no in, in interventions um, to, to, to the birth rate. Oh, no, 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 um, not, not, no, not in, no interventions. Um, the, the number of countries try to control the birth rates are remain stable around 40 countries, okay? Um, so, um, of course, um, the first degree are kind of increasing and uh, then the third, third category is kind of stable and uh, then the countries in the second category are decreased, decreased. So, overall, we can see the trend is really clear. Um, the aging problem is not only a Chinese issue, but a uni uh, the universal issue around the world. So more and more countries adopt policy to try to increase the birth rates 
increase the control, the, the, the birth rates. Okay. Um, so let, let me skip this one. <coughs> let, let's talk about. So a lot of countries, more and more countries are trying to adopt policy to increase the birth rates. Okay. Is this policy working or not? That's the key question, right? Well, it said China under two charter policies, we still cannot really get off the aging process. Okay, next step probably we totally relax two charter policy, no control at all. Probably more, you know, dramatic. We need to increase, encourage the parents to have uh, more children. Okay, um, so. Is this kind of policy really can work or not? Okay, of course, uh, it, it's really hard to say for China, but we can, you know, learn some lessons from other countries and the regions. Um, in one of the papers, Tan 2013 summarized the effect of prenatal policy. Prenatal policy is just the policy encouraging the birth of the household in Japan, Singapore, South Korea, and uh, Taiwan, China, okay. So, these four countries and the regions are all the Asian countries and the regions, and uh, some of them have similar cultures like China, okay. Um, how does it have the parental policy worked or not? It's really this kind of policy can increase the birth rates, the fertility rates of these countries. Well, the answer is not quite, okay. For Japan and Singapore, the, the parental policy have existed for more than 20 years. But this policy to increase the birth rates, the effect is quite trivial, almost non-exist, okay. Um, for, for Korea and uh, Taiwan, they adopt policy, this kind of planet policy more recently. Um, okay, so for the long term effect, it's still hard to see, but at least given the current data, we didn't see any significant effect at all. Okay, so the picture is not really, you know, optimistic. Um, you can see it's, it's really hard for, for, for China to really reverse uh, this, this kind of urgent process. Uh, even we adopt parental policy now. Okay. Um, so, <coughs> so, what's the but can, now, if, if the, the aging process is kind of inevitable, and uh, given the current age, uh, the population structure of China, what can we do? Of course, um, that, that, that's the key issue, okay? Um, so I want to share some, my, uh, some of my thoughts uh, with you, and we can discuss. Um, one thing is, of course, uh, the Given the endowment of our populations, we need to change the economic and the industrial structures. That's both from the demand side and the supply side. Um, from the demand side, the age structure in China changes quite a lot. The percentage of the old, older people increase quite a lot, and the Younger people, the children who are younger than age 15 are decreasing. Okay, so different age group, they will demand different service and different consumer goods. Okay, so from the demand side, because the age structure changed the demand for different cons consumption goods, that's all required the country or the economy change its industrial structure and the economic structure to meet the demand. That, that's from the demand side. 
And the other from the endowment side, okay, <coughs> the H structure or is directly related to the labor force, okay. The labor force, of course, is a key endowment of our countries, okay. Um, the changing of the age structure will change in the competitive advantage of endowment. That will change the competitive advantage in the international market. Okay. So, if the endowment structure changed, then the industrial structure also need to be changed to reflect the competitive advantage of the endowment. So both from the demand side for the consumption and from the endowment of the um, factors uh, ask for industrial structure change, okay? So if we cannot change the public structure, or if we, we can only change a little of the in public structure, then we need to change what we can, okay? What we can is we need to change the, the industrial structures. The other is, we'll try to prolong the aging process, make the process as slow as possible, okay? Um, how to make this process as slow as, as possible? Okay, in this context, it's useful to think about in the context of demographic dividends, okay? We can divide it, the demographic dividend into two categories. One is the first demographic dividend. That means the transition to a low fertility rate leads to a period in which the population of working age increase faster than the consumption populations. Because the, when the fertility rate decreases, then there are less less children born at a certain time, right? The children is kind of consume, not pre, pre, produce. Okay, so in the process, the wor working age population are kind of increasing, but the consumption population are kind of decreasing. This is the first uh, period of demographic dividends uh, period. Uh, okay, but eventually the working population will cease to decrease. As we already see, the Chinese working population is kind of peak out in the 2010. So it's kind of tr transitory, okay. So how, how do we prolong the, the first, first demographic dividend? The first one already discussed is kind of postponed retirement age because now it's possible given that the life expectancy are kind of increasing from around 42 to more than 70 years old, okay. Probably it's not really a mandatory ret postponed retirement age because in the several years ago, the people when um, people talking about the postponed uh, retirement age, there's still a lot of debate in, in the Chinese society, okay. So, okay. Using the economic incentive to induce the older people to participate in the labor market. So it's not really a mandatory postponed retirement age, but we can adopt a kind of flexible retirement age. Okay. Nowadays, the, the Chinese retirement age system is quite rigid. For example, for the university professors, I should be retired at age 60. Um, I'm really happy about that, but uh, <laughs> you know, but uh, for the US professors, uh, some of them from the, 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 the universities in US. Um, when I was a student at the US, uh, at that time, it's, it just happened, the US uh, adopt the, uh, it's, it's kind of, uh, demolished the mandatory retirement age, okay? So the, 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 the employers cannot force the employees to retire, okay? So I think th th that's one of the directions, okay? So we, we need to give the, the people the choice, okay? Whether 
you should retire or not, is not it should be set by the government. It should be, you know, your own decisions. You can, you can if you willing to work longer, then you can work longer. If you can afford to retire early, then you can retire early. Okay. And the other is to overcome the education mismatch or over educations. Okay. <coughs> well, I mentioned already. Is Really, the, the improve of human capital is a really good thing, but sometimes it's have also negative implications. If we have a mismatched problem, of education problem, and this is especially important in Chinese case. Okay, for example, my universities, they be universities, even for star positions. They require a doctor degree to be a secretary. I don't know why. So this is obviously uh, over educations. Okay. So this kind of over educations, on the one hand, it's kind of waste of the limited, scarce resource of, of the education, and uh, the other, it's really waste time of the people to can have a minimal active um, labor force period. So it's important to have the vocational educations. Now, um, the government are trying to reform and uh, improve the vocational system in China. So I think that's a good direction. The third one is increase the labor force participation rates of the female and elderly. Okay, um, a lot of female that withdraw from the labor force because they need to care, take care of the children, okay? If the public policy can really promote the public child care system, then the, the mothers can have a more um, time to, can really have a choice to participate in the, the, the labor force. Another one is adopted a lot of European countries, but not in China, for example, the the husband can also share the household responsibility with, with, with the wives. For example, when a household has a children, not only can the mother can take a leave, but also the father can take a leave. Both this kind of policy can increase the participation rates of the female into the labor market. And also uh, for, for the elderly as well, as I mentioned, and the retirement age is one policy we should consider to change, and the other we should encourage the, the uh, older people to really uh, stay in the, into the labor market. Um, the, the fourth important one is tap on the rural populations. Okay, now where well, the hookah system, a lot of people are familiar with kind of separated population in China into two groups, the rural people and the urban people. Urban urban people, of course the system is undergoing, it's under reform, it's gradually moving to the right direction, but we should to do more. Under the current systems, <coughs> for the rural people, they cannot really settle down in the cities, okay? Then they have implications. A lot of migrant workers only stay in the city temporarily, okay? This kind of uncertainty creates two problems. One is for the migrant workers, the duration of migration is quite short. They cannot really, you know, stay the whole life assimilated into the cities. And uh, the other dimensions is the kind of the incentive to improve the human capital of the migrants is more. Because the migrants, they see they only stay in the city temporarily, so they are not willing to invest themselves to improve their skills. For the employers, they also see the migrants sooner or later will left the enterprise to return to the villages. So the on job trainings is kind of, for the, for the employers, there are no incentive to provide the um, on job trainings for the, for the migrants. So if we can change the system to adopt policy to uh, encourage the people 
the migrants people assimilated into the <coughs> cities. Then both the duration of the this the, of the uh, they stay in the labor market and also the quality of the migrant workers will increase. That will improve, prolong the first demographic dividend. The second demographic dividend um, is coming from the, the aging process. Okay, typically, if we look at the life cycle models, in the first period for, the, for your working, that's the adult age, you accumulate asset, and then in in the old, in the second stage in the old age you consumption right you consume uh, the the capital you accumulate in the first stage. So really speaking, the old population have more asset than others. Okay, so the population aging will increase or raise the percentage of the older people in the society, that will means per capita, the, as the capital per, per, per capita will also increase because the older people have more capital and now we have more older people. So taking the society as a whole, the per capita asset will also increase. <coughs> more capital, can raise the productivity and the, the capital in some sense can be substituted for the labor force that in some degree can ease the shortage of labor force and also can you know, um, provide one solutions for the aging problems. Okay, um, so let me stop here and we have a break and then come back so um, in the last part, uh, I left the, the last slides, okay. Um, so uh, basically, when we're talking about the population, we can um, think about the uh, basic economic models. We have the production function, which import is K and L, the capital and the labors. Of course, the labor have two dimensions is the quantity and the qualities, okay. Um, in the aging society like China, what can we do, okay? Um, the aging, of course, will affect age structure, which affect the quantity of the labors. For that, um, one thing we can adopt, adopt different fertility policy, and the other we mentioned, we can increase the labor force participates for certain segment of the um, populations like the female and the, uh, the um, <coughs> elderly peoples. And the other, um, we can um, try to improve the productivities. Then that's one dimension to one, you know, um, way to improve the productivity is to improve the quality of the labor that will flow through the education and the trainings. For example, the, the vocational training is a really compo important component for the education system to provide the skilled laborers uh, for, for, for the society. And the other is on job trainings. Uh, that's quite important for the migrants. I mentioned because the hookah systems um, a lot of migrants, they're not willing to invest themselves, and the employers also has no incentive to provide on job trainings. If we can reform the hookah system, then the quality of labor was, can increase. Um, and uh, another side, for the production, remember we also have the AIF, the, the, the functions, okay? In order to improve productivity, we also need to reform the current um, structure or institution factors, which kind of not really um, friendly to the, to the uh, productivity, like the state or enterprise, like the whole ecosystem, etc. Um, and on the other hand, we um, because the, the 
population aging process will, I mentioned, will change the endowment of the labor itself, will change the competitive advantage of the labor and the capital. So that will require to adjust for the industrial structures. Okay, uh, so th this is the first part of the lecture I want to share with you. Um, and for the second one, it, it's uh, um, related to, to, to the population and the aging one, but it's different. Okay. Um, the, the first part is more from the overall picture or, or, or what's the current situation, the historical trends of the demogra demographic and the implications of the family planning policy and the labor market, etc. And the second part um, is more at the household and the individual levels. <coughs> Basically, um, I want to uh, talk um, one issue is how the social pension system in China affect the health and the living arrangement of Chinese uh, elderly. Okay. So uh, I will talk about the uh, Zoo pension system in China briefly and the data and the, the, the how to, uh, how we, you know, study the re relationship between the pension system and the health outcome and the living arrangement. Um, and the result, and then with some discussions. Okay. <coughs> um, in the first part of the lecture, uh, I mentioned the aging problem is not only in the phenomena of the China, but uh, in some sense, it's, it's, it's a worldwide phenomenon. So, um, of course, the, the aging process will affect the uh, production, the labor market, market etc., um, and also um, it will the well-being of the elderly people will become an important issue for the government. Okay, so a lot of government will try to you know how to in, in, increase the, the well-being of the elderly people. One of them is to establish and expand the, the pension system for the older people. Um, this also happened uh, around the world. In China, um, we have a, a very important social policies or target to improve the, the well-being of elderly people. That's in the 2009, the Chinese government launched the, the new pension, new rural pension scheme, NRPAs in rural China. Okay, uh, so. Th this is quite important because um, the, the population itself in China is the largest one in the world. Uh, and uh, we already see the older population is becoming more and more. And among the older peoples, uh, more than half of them are living in the zoo areas, uh, in the zoo areas. But uh, traditionally, okay, traditionally, uh, if uh, some of them are from zoo areas, you already know the traditionally the pension system only cover part of the population in China, not cover the whole population. Okay, um, the so most specifically, the zoo population are left out of the pension system provided uh, by the government um, in the zoo areas. Um, the the older people really uh, rely on the families and relative old age support. Okay. But this kind of traditional family support has faced great challenge. Okay. Um, one is increase of the zoo to urban migration since 1980s. For example, the zoo to urban migrant workers. That means the, the migrants left the hometown, they stay and work at different places. In the 2008, the number of migrant workers is 140 million. In 2014, this number increased to 168 million. Okay, so this create a lot of left behind old peoples, left behind parents. Okay, so the, the migrants 
early when, when you news, read the newspapers, they're talking about left behind children. That's one important um, issues. And then the other important issue is left behind parents, okay? The other is the reduced family size due to the family planning policies and the decrease at the fertility rate. For example, in the, the data from the statistical yearbook from 1978 to 2012, <coughs> the size of the household or the family in China decreased quite a lot. Okay. We, we, the solid blue line, that's, that's all household in China as examples. Um, in 1978, the average household size is around 4.6. But uh, in 2012, it's just uh, roughly uh, around 3.2 or something like that. Okay, so the decrease of the whole family size and also the migrants from the to urban create challenges for, for the traditional family support for the old age populations. Okay. <coughs> the old age support from the family is the cornerstone in the older days in the Zor, in the Zor China. Because in the Zor China, the pension system doesn't really exist. In the 1950 to 1970, no formal pension assistance. Okay, the Zor residents can only depend on the land and the family for old age support. Okay, in, in 1990s, some part of the regions try uh, some Zor pension insurance assistance, uh, but uh, it's kind of unsuccessful. Okay, so according to the 2000 census, for the Zor elderly people aged 60 and above, only 5%, less than 5% of them receive pension benefits, okay? Around 40% of them still had to work, okay? And uh, roughly around half of, of them are depends on the family to support for the old age life. So th that's the 2000 uh, situations, okay? But uh, the, this kind of family support system is not really meet the challenge of the current situation of China. So in order to address the, the issues, in the 2009, the Chinese government launched the new rural pension scheme in rural China. Okay, basically, all rural residents age 16 and above who are not in school or not in, in Zor, in the other system can be participate, are uh, eligible to particip participate, but the participation is voluntary. Uh, it's not mandatory um, policy. You, you can you know, choose to participate or not. The contribution for the system is from three parties. It's from the individual contribution and also from the subsidies from the central and the local government. Yeah. Okay, the money contributed from the government, from the central and the local government are vary across regions. For the poor region, the central government contribute more, but for the rich region, the local government contribute more. Um, participants who have contributed for 15 years will be eligible for a pension at age 60. So you can contribute 60 years, 15 years. Um, of course, the 15 years is the same as the urban pension system. Um, for, for that years, uh, there are a lot of debate for the, that period. A lot of people think the 15 years is, is too short to really make the system sustainable. Um, but, uh, um, so that's also a key policy parameters uh, under debate um, currently if some of them are interested in Chinese pension systems. Okay, 
Um, I don't know the U.S. system, probably it's more than 15 years, right, to, to, to really receive the pension. <coughs> um, so because it's a new system, if the people already, you know, older than 60 years, what happened to them? Um, okay. Basically, they have uh, some regulation on this. For the population already age 60 years old, they can directly receive the basic pension benefits if the children contribute to the system. Okay. So this is the family bonding eligibility requirement. But in practice, um, <coughs> this regulation dropped in some areas. Or you can, you know, pay a lump sum contribution into the system and then receive the pensions. Uh, so from the data, 2003 to 2015, we have the contributors. This is the millions, OK? Well, and uh, the pensioners, this is the people who receive the pension, OK? We see that until 2009, the contributors are not really that many. They remain quite stable. And the people who receive pension are even quite small. Okay. But after the new pension system in the zoo areas, the contributors increase dramatically. And also the people who receive the pension. The contributor include the people who still are young, not age, less than 60 years old. So then they are contribute to the system, but are not receive the pension benefit yet. OK, the pension, uh, that means the people are age over 60 and they receive pension already. <coughs> the, the pension system is not started universally at the country at once. It's gradually zero out. Uh, country by country, county by counties, okay. In 2009, around 10% of a county launched the, uh, the, the, the pension system, and this number uh, gradually increasing to 2012, almost all Chinese near 2,000 counties have this system in place, in place. So, the system is kind of zoomed out gradually um, across the countries. The basic pension benefit is not that high compared with the urban pensions. Okay, the monthly pension benefit is about fifty RMB. That's the minimum. That's roughly nine US dollars at the beginning. Um, in 2013, okay, according to now data, <coughs> the average, the basic pension was about 80 RMB yen, it's about 13 US dollars, okay. So the, the absolute number of, of the benefits is not big compared with the urban pension system. Um, but uh, put into the context of the zoo areas, it's not negligible. For example, it's account for around 13% of the average per capita net income in the area. It's equivalent to about 14% of the per capita net income in the area. It's equivalent about 18% of the per capita living expenses among Chinese zoo household. And it's equal to around 40% of the Chinese official poverty line in 2011. Okay, so the, the, the nine US dollar or the 13 US dollar seems quite low, but if we put into the context of Chinese zoo situations, it's not really negligible amount, okay. <coughs> um, the 
basic pension benefit uh, also increase over time. Um, in the 2009, the yearly income, the, the yearly benefit is around 500. Um, in the 2014, it's almost doubled to around 900 renminbi yim. But of course, um, for, for, for the elderly people, they cannot solely rely on the pension to alive. They also need to have other resources to maintain a living. So <coughs> then an important question we, we want to investigate is how the pension affect the health care, uh, health outcome of the elderly, OK? Because in the literature, there is a huge amount of literature study the relationship between the income and the health, and also how the pension status and the income affect the living arrangement of Chinese elderly. Okay, the living arrangement uh, in the literature is a key dimension of a quality of life, and uh, in China even so, because remember in the zoo Chinas, traditionally the older people are rely on the family for the old age support. So the living arrangement is a key component of the old age support. <coughs> That's also an important measure of long-term care demand in old age, okay. But in the literatures, for the income on health, the results are quite mixed. For the developed countries, um, some study found the income have a really big impact or positively on the health. But some study also found also the relationship is positive, but the um, effect is small. There are also some study found there are no impact at all or even have a negative effect. Okay. So it's quite mixed. Uh, <coughs> um, income is also quite important, not only for the developed countries, but also for the developing countries, uh, because um, for the health, we know the health productions, um, the, the income, the through the budget constraint, it's important to determine the health of the people, especially for the elderly people who are vulnerable to the health shock. And the study on the developing countries and the transition countries, they also show they exist uh, the positive correlations between the income and the, um, the health um, for the pension income and also income as well. For, for the income on the living arrangement, the results are also mixed, okay? Um, the, some study found uh, if older people have a more income, then the likelihood of in, independent living will increase. Okay, so if you have a more income, you ha can have the ability to live alone. You don't need to live with your children. Okay, this, this one strand of fundings. But also there are some fundings that if the parents' income is increased, then probably the children are now are more, more willing to live with the parents now because the parents became rich. So the increase of the co-residents. Some of them are also found no significant effect. Okay, so the, the, the results are quite um, mixed uh, in the literature. For Chan's case, um, there are two studies. Uh, one is on the urban, one is on the zoo areas. Uh, they both found a positive effect, okay? But the effect is not that large. Of course, <laughs> to study this kind of issues, um, the, everybody knows the indigeneity of the income or the pen, pension participations has become a, 
of key issues uh, because the selection bias, et cetera. They also have a reverse causalities. For example, the health can impact the health, the, the, <coughs> the income, and the income can have a, also reversely have an impact on the, on the health, on, on et cetera. That's where who uh, have a, um, can bias the, the estimations, okay? If, it, for example, we, and uh, if we're taking the relation between relationship between the income and the health, um, it's not easy to really identify the, the uh, causal relationship between these two, um, because in the life cycle models, um, your pension income will depends on your work history, right? And your work history will, you know. Um, in some degree, will rely on your health status in, the, in your old, in your early life cycles, and then the relationship you can see in the old age between the pension income and the health maybe not only reflect the relation between the pension income and the health, but also reflect the working histories of the income and the um, uh, health in the early period before re your retirement. So it's a really complicated one. Um, so, but uh, in, in, in our Chinese case, <coughs> the, the pension income, at least for the, for the zero pension income one, is not really depends on your life cycle, the life history, because the new one, it, it's uh, don't matter what your any history looks like before you receive the pension. It's also don't depends on your uh, health uh, in your <coughs> in your uh, life period before you uh, receive the pensions. Receive the pensions, and secondly. There's a, I mentioned, this the pension system are not rule out um, countrywide at once, but uh, it's rule out gradually at the country level. Okay, it's first implemented in 320 pilot counties, and then expanded to more than 800 counties in 2010, and to around um, 19 countries in 2011 and cover all the rural counties in 2012. So there's a time variation for the rule out of the rural pension systems. So what, what, what kind of data will you in to try to estimate how the pension status and the pension income on the <coughs> health and the living arrangement. The data we're using here is called the Chinese Longitudinal Healthy Longevity Survey, okay? So this data is a panel data. It's collected by the Peking University and also get funding from the national institutions on aging of the United States. The survey um, is a panel, I said, it started in 1998, and uh, um, it's still continued. The last wave is 2014, okay. Um, so when I introduced the pension system, we, we, we know that the pension start to launch in 2009. So we used the 2008 wave as the baseline, and then um, we'll see what happened after the pension start into uh, go to implementations. Okay. Um, this, this is the brief introduction of the data. Um, the key independent variable, of course, is the 
whether you are in the pension or not, okay? Um, so if the people receive the pension, the, the rural pension, they are the treated group. Otherwise, they are the control group, uh, the, the, the control group. Um, so in the 2011, the around 20% uh, of the people um, involved in, in the pension program and the monthly pension income is about 92 um, Chinese yuan. For the outcome variables, um, uh, we basically start two dimensions uh, of the outcome. As I said, one is the house outcome, the other is the living arrangement. The house is a multiple health outcome, the self-reported one. There are also other objective measurement uh, I'll talk later. Um, they also have a cognitive function, psychological well-being and the mortalities. Um, <coughs> for the living arrangement, of course, we're basically uh, interested in two uh, status. One is living in independently, and the other is living with others, with, with others, okay? Uh, so the empirical strategy is quite um, a simpler one. Um, basically, why is the health outcome or the living arrangement, and the key variable is the pension status or pension income, and the control or other variables which you should, and uh, also have uh, the <coughs> time dummies and the fixed fact. Um, the thing is, we mentioned before, um, the pension status, so it is kind of uh, endogenous because whether the people involved in the pension is voluntary and uh, it's not uh, mandated by the government, so it's endogenous. So if the pension status is endogenous, so does the pension income. Um, this indigeneity can be you know, biased uh, results. It can be down, downward bias or it can be upward bias. Uh, depends on you know, um, which group of older people are more likely to absorb in, 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 the, in, the in the program. So, <laughs> um, but uh, the good thing is what we, we, we have the time valuation of the pension program, um, which means the different city started the program at a different time. So the length of program duration at the county level is different in our survey data, and uh, we can use this as an instrument um, to try to correct for the indigeneity of the pension status. Um, so basically, <coughs> um, in the data we have, um, it's around 40% counties, it's the start program in 2009, and 20% in 2010, and 11% in 2011. Um, so what's the health outcome um, we have? We have the health in outcome we have different measurement of health one is the self reported one um, of course this one it's you have to be easy to ask uh, a lot of survey question uh, have this measurement um, but but uh, they also have some critique on this measurement. We also have uh, some objective, objective measurement, like RADL limitations, hypertension, etc., or the, the height, etc. Um, for the older people, okay, um, if if you're getting old, you, your height can be shrinked. Okay, the degree of shrinkage in some degree can reflect the health status of the older people. 
Um, so we also have the score reflect the psychological well-being and also um, have a measurement for the cognitive functions um, or have the, the depression goods, the depression scores. Okay, uh, so if uh, we adopt the, the fixed effect model uh, with, with the instrument, instrumental variable corrections that we get, okay. Um, for, for the self-report health, basically the results are not significant, but for all the measurement, um, it's a, if you enroll in the pension or if you receive the pension income, then the <coughs> it will improve your IDL scores, okay, and uh, will reduce the, the incidence of the hypertension. Um, also, uh, the height will increase, the shrinkage of height actually, not the height itself, but the shrinkage of height between the baseline and the 2011, yes. Uh, professor, what level do you use for fixed What's that? What's the level of your fixed What's level for the fixed fact? That, that's with, at the county level. Not, not at the county level, but the individual level. Let me get the, get the model. Individual level, yeah, we, we get that individual level. Yeah, that's the individual level. Yeah. Uh, there also, um, you know, if you enroll in the pension, you will be not only physically, but uh, will be psychologically beneficial uh, for, for them participate uh, in the system and receive the pension income. Um, of course, um, one issue concern with the, you in the county level, um, Town valuation as LV is that uh, some people were, were only about um, <coughs> uh, the rule out of the pension system will somehow correlate it with the health status at the county level, etc. So um, we try to see whether this concern um, is uh, really exist in the data or not, and. Uh, we didn't find anything that basically um, the county, you know, threw out the pension system at, at a different time. Of course, they are different probably by a certain um, X uh, measure at, at, a, at the county level. But the key thing is they are not really correlated with the health at, at the county level, okay? So I will Skip this one, um, and then we we'll also try some test um, to, to 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 carry out some flexible test to see whether the fixed effect mode assumption is valid or not. Basically, we try different things. Uh, one thing is uh, we use the data before the pension system started from 2005 to 2008, okay, if they have a different trend uh, for the, uh, <coughs> exist even before the pension system, then our funding may be in, uh, driven by the different trend, but uh, not by the pension program itself, or didn't fund anything. And then we use another samples uh, for the elderly people who, in the urban area, not eligible for the <coughs> uh, for, for the zoo pension system. Okay, that will capture whether the country level heterogeneity affect the health status or not. Okay, if the country level heterogeneity affect health status, then this uh, observable in principle will not only affect the zoo people but also the uh, urban people, if it also affect 
urban people, then we should find in this one, but we didn't find anyone, et cetera. Uh, okay, so in the, <coughs> in the paper, we also have a different test, but uh, I just skip them. Um, so uh, that's basically funding. Another question we ask, want to ask is how the pension system through which affect the health. Okay, we, we explored different channels. Is the nutrition intakes and the health behavior. And uh, the second one is health care. Um, the third one is the labor supply and the labor. Um, the third one, of course, if you have a pension income, then probably you feel um, your economic status are in improved, so psychologically you will feel better, exaggerous. Um, I will not talk in all the channel here, but I just uh, highlight some of, of them. Okay, uh, the thing what we found is for the people who involve in the program, they indeed think they have a sufficient financial support for the daily expenses, okay? And uh, the intake of the protein rich food are also increased. Um, intake of vitamin food also um, not important, but uh, um, is kind of significant. So basically, um, from the you know, nutrition intake, it's mainly from the protein rich food uh, channel, not, not from the vitamin one. Um, in the literature, the, the people also worry about for the older people, if the people have a money, maybe they can, you know, use this money irresponsibly. Uh, for example, they can, they have a pension income, they are, you know, smoking, increased smoking and in, increased drinking, that will not improve the health, but uh, will negatively affect the health, okay. Is this, um, is this kind of worry um, can be true in China or not? Okay, we found it's not the case. Okay, for the pensioners or non-pensioners, uh, the likelihood of smoking is uh, quite similar as no significant in fact. Okay, um, in some sense, it's also it's decreased the likelihood of drinking. It's drinking. So this. This too is, is uh, kind of different from uh, some, some countries. Uh, in, in some countries, um, they find, okay, um, the elderly people, they get an increase of pension income. They can spend the uh, money on such negative um, consumption goods, which will adversely hurt the, the health. Uh, but in, in Chinese Zor, elderly people, we didn't see this kind of thing happened. Um, <coughs> another thing is the health care. Uh, whether for in, informal health care or for health care access, that means in, for, to, for the access to formal health care, um, the pension or the pension income um, increase both kind of the health care, okay? Um, so that's also a key um, point, um, key channel that runs through the pension status uh, to the uh, health uh, outcome. Um, so I skip others and I conclude what we found in, in, the, in the health outcomes, okay? So the basic funding is the so pension status and uh, income really have a beneficial impact on the health outcome of the older people in the zoo areas, okay, in different dimensions, both psychologically or physically, and uh, cognitive functioning improve as well, okay. 
Um, so, as we discussed, this kind of improve of the health outcome um, come from the how the pensioners responds to the pension income. Okay, they can get better access to health care, and uh, they also be able to get more um, informal care and uh, have improved nutrition and um, intake. Okay, so that's one channel. And the other channel uh, we didn't discuss now, but uh, we also found um, for the older people, they receive the pension and uh, attend, um, then they work less and they enjoy more. Um, that's also beneficial for most house income, okay? Uh, and uh, the pension income from the pension system also improved the self-perceived relative economic status of the elderly people. That also helped to promote the physical functions and the mental well-being. And so they feel better now because they are, have a, its own financial resources, not you know, as a burden of the younger generations, um, only rely on the um, families. <coughs> so it, it's quite important um, to, to contact, uh, to compare um, the, the, the different uh, public policies in terms of to try to improve the health. Because we, we already know in the since 2000s, uh, Chinese government uh, launched a lot of uh, public policies. Some policies are directly try to improve the health status of the population. For example, the Xin Longhe, right? So that, that, that's the one try to do direct intervention to improve the, the, the health of the rural people, okay? Um, another set of policy is not really a health policy, but uh, it's other policies. But this kind of policy, we also found they can improve the health, okay? So the, through the non-medical channels, through the non-medical channels. For, for the Xin Longhe and the, the medical policies, there are a lot of studies to see whether they can increase the health status, et cetera. Um, the, the funding are quite mixed. Some funding, the, the fund is, can increase the health, but on the other hand, the also fund under that, under that policies is increase the expenditure of the um, health care because uh, now the price are decreased, uh, whether from your old demand or from the derived demand of doctors. So the, the uh, cost of health care increase in the Zoe China increase quite a lot under the new uh, health care policies. And uh, so in this, in this uh, pension system we study here, we found even though the main objective of this policy is not really directly improve the health, but it's um, improve the health nonetheless through other non-medical channels. Um, so probably it's important to you know, explore uh, different um, policies, different programs to see which one is most beneficial or cost benefit to improve the, 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 the health status and how to you know, um, combine the strengths of different programs together. Okay, um, now let, let me, well, we'll have a, several minutes uh, to talk about the living arrangement. Uh, okay, um, for the living arrangement, basically we also found the, no matter it's the pension status or pension income can increase uh, the indep independent livings, they can increase the independent livings, okay. Um, the independent livings, uh, <coughs> overall they can in increase independent livings, but about, uh, um, the likelihood are different 
by whether you have a children live nearby or not, okay? So we divided the living status into three categories. One is co-resident. The second category is living alone with children nearby. That's defined in the, within the same community or village. And the third category is living alone with children, with no children nearby, with no children nearby, okay? So basically we found most of the increasing of the independent living is for this group, for the elderly who have children live nearby. So in some sense, for this group of elderly, on the other hand, after they receive pension, they can live independently. Probably they can preserve the privacy. On the other hand, because they have children nearby, they can you know, also easily access the informal care, informal support uh, from the, the, the children. Um, so uh, we also have a lot of results in the paper, but I just stop them uh, and summarize briefly. Uh, so the participation to the program increased independent living, okay? Um, and uh, also the, the income from the pension um, increase the independent the likelihood of increased living and the income elasticity is quite large compared with the previous study on China um, on China um, uh, because um, we think uh, after we correcting for the endogeneity of the pension income then the downward bias will be uh, in some degree uh, corrected, um, but it's much lower than the elasticity in the developing countries. Um, one thing we think is that because the pension benefit from the raw China is still quite low compared with other countries, uh, for example, the US. Um, in China, we only have around it depends on which year. The most recent years, it's around 20 US dollars. In the early stage, it's less than 20 US, less than 10 US dollars. Uh, and the independent living has multiple dimensions in China, okay? Um, whether the pension income can increase the independent living will depends on whether you have a children nearby, the, capacity, the financial capacity of the older people, the long-term care needs of the older people, or the privacy concern of the older people. I didn't report the result here, but I already said for the children, for the older people with children nearby, this, the likelihood will increase quite a lot. Okay, for the older people already, you know, have uh, uh, more financial resources, additional Pension income will increase the likelihood of independent living more. Okay, um, if the older people is more healthy, then it's more likely to in live independently after receiving the pension income. That's not surprising. And uh, for the um, elderly people with high education, they are more care about the privacy after receiving the pension income. So they are more willing or likely to live independently. Okay. Um, so <coughs> this is what we found here. Um, in, in the literature, we, remember in the beginning I talking about uh, the, the literature. It's kind of mixed findings. Um, some findings found the pension income can increase the independent living of the elderly. Some people, some fundings, it's not. It's increased the likelihood of the older people to live with their children. So the, the funding is quite mixed. Okay. Um, so we think one reason for the mixed fundings is that not all older people behave the same, right? Okay, depends on the um, 
characteristics of the older people, whether they live with, with a, uh, whether they have a adult children nearby, uh, uh, the financial capacity, education level, et cetera, whether they need the health care or not, um, the impact on the uh, living arrangement are differently. Um, so the positive effect of the income from the <coughs> living arrangement, you know, concentrate with these three groups, um, with eight children live nearby, uh, higher SEAs, uh, social economic status, without the health um, care uh, needs. Uh, other group we found in significant in, in, in significant effect. Okay. Uh, so I think uh, a lot of time, uh, we just stop here. And uh, if you have a question, we can discuss um, after the class. Thank you.